Good evening. Welcome to the 2020 Candidates Forum. I'm Jean McFarland, the program moderator. This segment features the candidates running for state representative in the 85th Assembly District. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked by the candidates by members of the local media from the Record Journal. The second part will allow each candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer portion of the program, each candidate will have two minutes to respond. The opposing candidate will be allowed one minute for a rebuttal. To conclude the program, each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. The toss of a coin has determined the order of questioning with Mary Mashinsky going first. Before beginning the questioning, I'd like to introduce the candidates running for state representative in the 85th Assembly District. They are Mary Mashinsky, Democrat, and Weston Ulbrich, Republican. Mr. Gagney, will you ask your first question of Mary Mashinsky? Good evening. Good evening. Um, Mary, if elected uh, to the General Assembly, what do you believe will be our region's number one legislative priority that you would seek to address in that session? We're going to have to uh, deal with the people who are permanently unemployed due to COVID. There's about as many as 20% uh, may be unemployed because their line of work is um, not survivable in COVID. These would be people in retail, transportation, uh, hospitality, businesses like that. And my intention is to retrain these people, especially using apprenticeships for a new career. If their old career comes back, they're welcome to go back to it, but at least they'll have new skills and they'll be able to make a living. Mr. Ulbrich? Yes, um, I think the Department of Labor recently said that um, you know, it was 13% unemployment, as high as 13%, so I think it's a little lower. However, I don't want to minimize the unemployed because I've met many at their doors and I feel really badly that the pandemic has caused their laying off. And, you know, I think people love being a chef. Uh, they, they love being passionate about their job, whatever it might be. And you know, I'm not sure the state has a great track record of workforce development. I think the private sector has a better track record of really placing people and improving skills. I think we should focus more on education uh, at, the, at the lower levels of, of government. Um, and that, you know, Wallingford needs more education funding. Um, I, I think we need the grants to improve our schools and renovate Sheehan and, and Lyman Hall. So I think we have to go after education and we have to let people know that are unemployed that there is un, un, uh, insurance for unemployment and you know, we have to get back to work as soon as we can in a safe way. Thank you. Lauren Takoras, will you please ask a question of Weston Ulbrich? Sure. Hi, Wes. Hi. Connecticut recently reached a 3% COVID-19 positivity rate for the first time since June, and more than 200 people are now hospitalized with the virus. What plans would you support to mitigate a third wave of COVID infections? You know, we have to pay attention to the science and treat each other well and, you know, tell everyone to wear a mask and distance from each other like we are tonight. Um, so those things have to stay in place until we get the vaccine. Uh, I know not everyone wants to hear that, but this is the reality of the situation. Um, as far as in the legislature, I, I think we have to repeal the sales tax on PPE, which is 6.35%. Uh, sales tax on the masks that I'm wearing right now. I, I had to pay tax on this and every family does, every every individual does if you buy one in Connecticut. It's it's not right, especially in this time. We should have brought the, that up in a special session already. Thank you. Mary Mashinsky. We are going to have to be very disciplined about um, COVID-19 and this is the first time I've ever debated in a mask my whole life. It's, it feels very strange. but. Uh, this is the way we have to protect ourselves and our community and our families for another few months. We do expect, the vaccine is in the third phase of trials, we do expect that it'll be available in the spring, maybe April or May, for the population in Wallingford. 
and that until now, from now till then, we will have to be vigilant, stay in our own little bubble of our own family, and uh, and even for Thanksgiving, not travel. Thank you, Lauren. Would you please ask the next question of Mary Mashinsky? All right. According to the State Department of Labor. The state has recouped about 60% of jobs lost in March and April during the first few months of the pandemic. However, in mid-September, the uh, state unemployment rate was estimated at 12 to 13%, and currently there's about 232,000 people who are collecting unemployment benefits. How would you spur economic growth and jobs recovery? What I do, what I, I also door knock, what I do when I find these folks, um, because they're not happy being furloughed, is I direct them to Platform to Employment, which is the program I set up statewide for apprenticeships for a new career. It's shorter than some of the other apprenticeship programs. If you want to be an electrician, it might take you several years. If you want to go to Platform to Employment, it's eight weeks. And in many cases, you'll start to get paid while you're still training. So I send people down to Platform to Employment. They learn a new career and they start getting paid even while they have not yet graduated. The average wage after graduation from P2E is $50,500, which is decent money. If they want to go back to being a chef or a bartender later, they can always do that, but they will get a job. It's 94% placement from this program. It's the most successful program I've ever worked on. Mr. Ulbrich. Now, like I said, uh, we, we shouldn't really rely on the private sector and nonprofits, I believe, because our, our state is running out of money. We can only throw so much money at state projects and state programs like workforce. We've, we've spent so much money on workforce that you know, it's in good attention, but the results aren't really there. Uh, we haven't recovered all the jobs from 2008's recession. It's going to be just as hard, maybe harder, recovering our unemployment rate after COVID. And... No, I think we just have to change up the strategy because the strategy we've been w working on in the past has, has not really worked. Step up is, is great, Representative Mishinsky, but you know, it doesn't reach enough people. The private sector has this market cornered and job placement and you know, HR services are, are very professionalized in our state and we should turn to them and stop spending the taxpayers' money on these programs. Thank you. Mike Gagne, will you please ask the next question of Weston Ulbrich. Wes, how can the state best help small business owners recover from their losses during the pandemic? Yeah, you know, I, I think it comes down to incremental deregulation and incremental tax relief on business. I walked into a store, the disc golf store in town, and you know he's getting his chair, his shelves, his computer, everything is, is taxed that he has in his store at a high rate, higher than most states. So we have to look at the deregulation and the taxes. And you know, it, it is an old Republican adage to cut spending and reduce taxes, but you know, it's time to do it because it's been forty years of one party rule and adding on to the taxes and regulation. It's, it's just time, time to make incremental changes that will bring back our higher paying jobs and the small businesses. And it, what a better time to do it than right now. Ms. Mashinsky. There are several things we can and we should do. One is, I just put on my state website uh, yesterday, we can publicize the CARES grants for small business. They can get 5,000 apiece if they apply. I'm passing out the link for how they can apply. That'll give them a couple months uh, help. We can make sure they have the PPE they need and we did pass out thermometers and uh, other tools that they needed to stay safe. We can buy, we can procure state services from small businesses uh, instead of buying them from out of state. And uh, another thing we can do for the downtown businesses is just encourage affordable housing around the train station in the downtown area. That technique is very good at 
keeping small businesses alive in the density part of the town. Thank you. Mike Gagney, would you please ask the next question of Mary Mashinsky? Another COVID-related question. Uh, it seems clear that COVID-19 crisis will significantly impact the economy and budget of the state of Connecticut itself. How do you plan to handle our future state budgets? Yeah, this one's going to be tough. Um, fortunately, uh, for a number of years, we've been working on building up the rainy day fund. I'm on the finance committee. Uh, twice we have changed the fund. First it was 5% of the budget, then it, we changed it to 10% of the budget, and then we changed it to 15% of the budget, and we uh, filled it this year. We even had enough left over that we put it into paying down the pensions, the pension uh, deficit. So for one year we have a grace period because we have a rainy day fund that we're now tapping. For next year, Governor has already asked the agencies for 10% cuts across the board, and we will have to just be as efficient as we can to squeeze um, the agencies and the services to do better. For example, I can give you one example. Uh, when we went through a, another period like this, um, my committee recommended New England-wide purchasing of prescription drugs for the Medicaid population that we serve. We saved $13 million just because we bought it in bulk. So that's the kind of thing that we are going to have to do more of next year. Mr. Ulbrich. Yes, um, my opponent voted against the 2017 budget that pretty much got the ball rolling on the rainy day fund, which is now $3.1 billion. And it serves our A-plus rating, which is the reason we have an A-plus rating with Fitch in uh, the ratings agency in New York. So, yes, we have to keep the rainy day budget intact because we finally have some savings of the state. But we have to go after the pension crisis. And it is a crisis long term. Uh, a lot of it's due to the rich benefits of 46,000 state employees. Um, you know, we have to go to HSAs and 401ks in, in those, in those uh, areas because those are the modern plans. They should join the, the modern world and go to these more improved and uh, beneficial retirement plans and health care plans. Also, um, we have to cut programs like the private selling of retirement plans by the government. The mar private market has it, it cornered, and we have Mr. to stop doing that. Mr. Elbrick, thank you. I would like to rebut this. Um, I was supporting the rainy day fund filling right up to the morning of the vote. I was in caucus. I was in finance committee supporting it. Is representative what, allowed to... Rebut? Yes, there's a one-minute right. rebuttal. When we get to um, your closing statement, you can um, do it at that point in time. Okay, so it's not after each question. Pardon? So it's not after each question, the one-minute rebuttal? No. Well, you have... Um, I'm sorry, yes, you do. Have, no, we're right That's what now the instruction on. said. Mary, so you were asked the question first, right? No. Oh, did I do this backwards? I'm sorry. Hang on just a second. Oh, Lauren, you asked the question of Weston? Yes. Okay, were you finished? Yes, you were finished. So, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I got in the wrong spot. I'm so sorry. I just want to, to say that I have supported the rainy day filling all along. That vote in 2017 was a protest vote because when I came in to vote on the package, one of the senators overnight had weakened a pollution law and stuck it in the budget. When I found it, I voted no on the whole thing. But I had supported rainy day fund filling right up till the morning of the vote. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Mary? What is your stance on regionalization of school districts? Who should make that decision, local leaders or state officials? I think regionalization is a good idea for saving money in general. Schools will be the hardest uh, because everyone wants their own education priorities for their own town and the towns are different in what they prioritize. However, the basic services that towns purchase for the schools can be done regionally. There's no reason why North Haven schools have to buy heating oil and Wallingford schools buy heating oil from a different company. There's no reason why they can't share uh, payroll services 
with one computer system. So the back office functions of education can be done regionally, and they are done regionally in other states. Uh, I don't think the curriculum will be done regionally, although there is a um, statewide uh, curriculum that all the schools are supposed to work from. But at least on the, on the uh, ordering and procurement, we should be able to do um, shared services in our region, as, a, as the rest of the country does. Mr. Alberg. You know, I've looked into this issue a lot, and I've talked to parents. Every time I see there's a family at a door where I knocked on, I, I asked about education, and they really are against regionalization in our town. I think good representation talks to people that live here, and you vote on as a representative to to what those values are as, as a community. And you know, parents don't want to lose local control of schools. They want more funding, and we are underfunded, I would say, per capita in Wallingford compared to other towns. Um, you know, there's 18% of state funding it goes to education, which includes museums and libraries. 15% goes to the pensions. It, it's not right, the, the priorities are out of whack. And, and in this year of crazy year of COVID and everything else, we have to reprioritize our state budget and really look at what's important, what's essential. Mike, would you please ask the next question of Mr. Ulbrick? Wes, in light of recent threats to the Affordable Care Act and a potential challenge to Roe versus Wade, uh, what should the state do to protect vulnerable populations facing the possible loss of health care and access to reproductive health care? So to the question of health care in Connecticut, um, yeah, affordability is, is the biggest problem that families have, working families. You know, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to to be a part of a family business that, you know, we don't, have, we don't have to worry about affordability too much as a family, but that's why I want to get into public office, to serve people and to think about others and to think about Wallingford and the future of our state. And affordability in healthcare is one of the biggest things on people's minds. It's prescription drugs, premiums have to come down. The prices are just too high. Um, Kevin Kelly, Senator Kevin Kelly of Stratford has a bipartisan bill nicknamed Kelly Care. Uh, that people are, people in the legislature, I think, would sign on to next session uh, to take $20 million and lower premiums and lower the prescription drug costs. And I would sign on to Kevin Kelly's Kelly Care program. Thank you, Mary. We are ahead of the federal government on health care. Um, this was a, actually a Democratic initiative. We set up our own health care pool in Connecticut. And if you do not have care anywhere else and you're uh, low income, you can join the Connecticut pool. We also, before the Federal uh, Affordable Care Act, we also let people stay on their parents' health care until they're 26. We also have already uh, put Roe v. Wade into Connecticut statutes. So even if it disappears on the federal level, it will still exist in Connecticut. So we've been a couple years ahead of the feds. I hope for the sake of the nation that Affordable Care Act is preserved. But if it's not, I think we can, uh, we can serve people in Connecticut with our expanding pool of the insured. Mike Gagney, would you please ask the next question of Mary Mashinsky. Yes. What should white elected officials do to ensure they're representing constituents of all races, ethnicities, and backgrounds? I forgot, I did not hear the first few words under the mask. Oh. What should white elected officials do to ensure that they're representing constituents of all um, races, ethnicities, and backgrounds? Well, we should do surveys, which I do. In, in the beginning of the year. We should reach out to the community groups, uh, for example, SCOW, and get their perspective. Uh, I met some dreamers through SCOW at a sit down with them to hear how they were trying to go to college and they were having trouble. 
Um, door knocking, of course, and community events, you run into uh, different folks of different incomes and different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, I went to the rally for Black Lives Matter and talked to my constituents there. There were thousands of people there and talked to them about their unhappiness with the uh, state of uh, enforcement against, disproportionately against um, black citizens. Mr. Osbrick? Yeah, I, I want to assure people that uh, who support my campaign or our campaign is, uh, and I want to assure people that I'm a proponent of equal justice under the law. Um, recently, as a member of the Greater Hartford Twilight Baseball League, as the secretary, our whole league, I led an effort with the whole league to get a field named after uh, Johnny Taylor, who was Connecticut's greatest pitcher, um, who was a Negro League player who was barred from joining the Yankees in the 1930s. So I want to assure people that I will protect the rights of any protected class, especially races. Um, you know, I have, I have all sorts of friends from different colors, different backgrounds, and we have to enforce discrimination laws and make sure everyone has equal opportunity. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Western Holbrook? Connecticut is experiencing a statewide drought after the blow of Tropical Storm Isaias, which are both stark reminders of what is to come if climate change is not taken seriously. What will you do on the state level to make sure Connecticut is a leader in climate change action? I think with Isaias, everyone saw that the conglomerates have too much power, the lobbies, in our state, even the senators who work for Eversource provided uh, legislation. They got behind legislation against their own employer because they know they're too powerful. So I think we have to look at how to how to mitigate some of their their power in our state. And the other company, Avangrid, is is from Spain. I, I don't know why we allowed a, comp a company from Spain to own our grid. I think it's a national security concern, and it's it's certainly an affordability concern because they don't have our best interest at heart here, here in uh, Connecticut for residents. Um, but as far as climate change, climate change is a real thing. As a 33-year-old, I've looked into the science, and you know, I think we have to invest more in solar in Connecticut. We have so many parking lots in Connecticut, especially right here in town, that you know, if, um, if we were to put, I read this article recently in CT Mirror, if we were to put solar panels in parking lots to, as coverings for cars, I know it sounds like a crazy idea, but we would save so much energy and we would actually gain some back for the grid. So I, I would go for the solar route. Uh, I think wind is too costly and then the, the blades, um, they, you have to put them in landfills and they might never disintegrate. So I think solar is the way to go and, and technology keeps improving. Um, the, the photovoltaic ribbon uh, keeps improving capacity. So, yeah, cl climate change is a big deal. We, we have to meet the challenges, but not at the detriment of businesses and the, the economy. We have to put people first and then, you know, look for sustainable, gradual solutions. Thank you. I don't is think... It, I was just going to ask your name, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Mashinsky. Um, I don't think we have a lot of time left. We have less than 10 years to um, turn this around before it becomes impossible to control. And I am concerned for the next generation that follows us. Uh, I did work on the state water plan. It took, took 20 years to pass it. It's in place. It passed last year to get us ready for water supplies for the future. It is All the agencies are now following the state plan. That's the first time that they're doing that. So. I'm more comfortable now that we're ready for taking care of our water. I oppose new fossil fuel plants and favor energy efficiency and clean energy. There's already solar on the landfill in Wallingford going up. There are 34,000 jobs in clean energy in Connecticut, potentially, and we've already passed a law to do offshore wind. And the, the offshore wind will, blades will be built in Connecticut in the coastal cities. It'll be jobs for Connecticut. I just want to add that. Um, can I add one, one, one sentence? 
No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. No problem. Um, you can at uh, the time sure. of your um, your final uh, conversation. Uh, Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Mary Mashinsky? Earlier this year, the State Department of Labor issued a staff work order against a Wallingford massage business that was listed on a website featuring user-generated reviews of sexual services. There were indications that the women inside were part of a prostitution ring. What should be done at the state level to curb human trafficking in Connecticut? We've actually done legislation on trafficking, and I can't remember if it made it through the Senate. It made it through the House. Um, it is a it is a continuing problem. There have been other busts in Wallingford earlier years years ago. Same story. Um, people come in from Asian countries. They are tricked to come here. They are um, unable to leave the facility. They can't even go out and make a phone call. Once they're here, they're trapped. And they were originally misled into coming here. So I guess uh, undercover sting operation, and then. Um, penalties for trafficking are what we have to do. And I regret that I can't remember if the Senate took this bill up, but uh, we, we did abruptly adjourn and uh, a lot of stuff died, so we may have to revisit this in uh, January. Mr. Ulbrich. Yeah, it's uh, the month of uh, anti-domestic violence abuse. Uh, so you know, I think it's appropriate question for right now. And you know, I, I think we need to empower proactive policing, actually, in this, in this sense. And the recent legislation against police, uh, which we're calling accountability, but which, which is really taking away the proactiveness, uh, police need to enforce these, these issues, especially with the massage parlor here in the local area. Uh, so if, if we were to support police and, and get their opinion on certain bills, and you know, support them, we, we would have a better chance at, at making a safer community. Thank you. Uh, Mike Gagney, would you please ask the next question of Weston Ulbrich? Wes, ridership on the CT Trail, this Hartford line, is down 80% of what it was before the COVID-19 pandemic, and home buying is now rising faster than renting. So besides investing in transit-oriented development, what other plans do you have for economic development here in Wallingford? You know, at the state level, I think we can provide more grants for economic development in, in Wallingford. At the bottom of the hill at Center Street, everybody knows those silos and some of the blighted property have been there for decades. And I'm not sure what our representative has done for that area commend her for her advocacy for CT Rail, although I think it was five to 10 years too early. As you noted, ridership was down 80%, but what, what was it before COVID? I, I think it was, it, was not, it was not all that impressive uh, as, as far as the Wallingford station goes. It's a great station, and I hope it, it uh, helps in the future, but I think we need to listen to the local experts like Tim Ryan, who studies this for a living. And, he has a development that he wants to work on um, on Tully's Road, which our representative got involved and in, was not in favor of, and it was squashed. But hopefully he's still looking into the Tully's Road project. And, you know, he, he, wants to also, he wants to also get behind a new use for the old Wallingford train station, which would be a, such a unique gathering point for people from out of town, from in town, to maybe go to a restaurant or an art museum or catch live music. Uh, it's such a unique building. We have great history, history here in Wallingford. We should lean on our placed, place-based tourism here in, here in Wallingford. The Center Street Cemetery could be a, more of a tourist attraction. Uh, believe it or not, there are some awesome stories in the Center Street Cemetery, including uh, you know, that, that point to a great history of our town as far as uh, racial equality. Um, if you ask Bob Devaney at the Center Street Cemetery, there, there's a lot of opportunity in that Center Street area. We just have to get some grants for it. We haven't done that. Thank you. 
Mary Mashinsky, would you? How you get the grants is the town has to decide. I have approached the town, they did not want to do it. But how you do it is the town has to assemble six or seven parcels that are ready to go. Their permits are all done, they're ready to go. Then you come in with a density development, especially around a train station, and you can get funding for this. It uh, is paired up with developers, tax credits, and the whole thing happens. We saw it happen in Meriden, for example. They rebuilt their whole downtown. I believe the ridership will return with the vaccinations. There were a million people riding the train. Uh, when I got on the train to go to the Capitol, there were 20 people with, with me getting on the train for my particular train. So the, the money is there and can be obtained if the town wishes to do it. If the town is going to leave everything to private market, they won't get the grants. If the town is ready to do it, I'm ready to do it. Thank you. Mike Gagne, would you please ask the next question of Mary Mashinsky? The most controversial provision of the recent police accountability bill includes changes to what's known as qualified immunity, which makes it easier for those who believe they've been wronged by police to file lawsuits against officers, departments, and municipalities. How do you feel about this particular provision? Do you think it needs to be looked at? Well, I went to the uh, Black Lives Matter rally. There were thousands of people there walling for people, and they were very distressed and they wanted changes in the law, and I said I would help to make that happen. So some of the changes that we made were uh, no chokeholds. Um, officers have to interfere if another officer is, is uh, beating up on a suspect, harming a suspect. The qualified immunity, we went back to the 1980s version of qualified immunity, which is there is protection unless there is malicious and willful uh, abuse of someone's uh, rights, the suspect's rights. So, and it's the same standard on the federal level, by the way. It will not, this bill will not harm a good officer. It is unlikely to ever be used in Wallingford. Wallingford has a community police that get along with the, uh, all the different ethnic groups. There are some towns in Connecticut where that is not true. And when we write a law, we write it for the entire state. So the few towns where they're having issues, the law will be applied evenly. I do not think it's going to be a problem for Wallingford Police. Mr. Ulbrich. Um, you know, I went to the rally too. I, I, I was there because I think the killing of George Floyd was abhorrent. Racism is, uh, racism is abhorrent. And you know, I held, held up a sign saying, we all bleed the same color. And I truly believe that, you know, I think that movement has, has changed a lot in, into some, sometimes chaos, so it's hard to get behind the, the movement now, especially when we've, the government, our own state government, has created more de divisiveness by this police accountability bill. And in Connecticut, I, I don't recall, especially in Wallingford, when the last police brutality uh, incident was. I, I don't think there's much of a connection between Wallingford and police brutality. It's going to cost us more. It's demoralized police. And our representative did not speak to police officers before she voted on the bill. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Weston Ulbrich? Okay. Uh, Eversource was criticized for implementing a rate increase in July and then for prolonged power outages following Tropical Storm Isaias in August, to the point where the legislature stepped in and created regulations around compensation for customers after long power outages. What should be done to ensure the most vulnerable aren't taken advantage of by utility companies? Yeah, did we already have this question? Did we? Oh, we already had this question on Eversource. I don't think there was a question on Eversource. I think it came up in the discussion. Okay, sorry about that. So we have to we have to treat ratepayers better as a state. Um, I, re I really think that all this regionalization talk 
could eventually just increase costs. Um, the model that Wallingford Electric has and Wallingford Water, and that, that's the model for the, for the future. Hyper-localization. Control in your own area. And, you know, other towns have their own utilities as well. We, we don't have to cave as a legislature to, to the utilities, to the public utilities. So, you know, I'm not sure the $250 for spoiled food or spoiled food voucher is, is good government. I think that's too niche. Um, I mean, anyone could say that my food is spoiled. And th there's other ways to go about it, like, like rate decreases for a certain period of time, especially during COVID. Um, so, yeah, it's not, it's not my area of expertise, energy, but you know, I, I know that businesses have a tough time operating here. Mostly, well, in part because of state governments, regulations, and taxes, but also energy costs are so high. Uh, our business at Ulbrich Steel, we're so lucky to have Wallingford Electric, although otherwise we wouldn't be able to operate in Connecticut. Um, so I think hyper-localization is actually the answer to our energy problems. Mary Mishinsky. The uh, question is not really as relevant to Wallingford. Uh, Wallingford does not have Eversource electricity. We have, um, we have Eversource gas, but not Eversource electricity. And that's fortunate because we don't seem to have the outage problems that um, people that live that don't live in Wallingford and have to live in some other town deal with whenever there's a big storm. Our utility only serves two towns. They do a great job. Um, the whole time I lived in my house, I don't think I've had one outage, and I've been here for a long time. But uh, one other thing we can do is uh, decentralized generation. If we do more solar, if we do more um, local fuel cells, especially for the critical services that, that uh, should not be shut down, or someone who is, uh, needs a breathing device and they need to have the power on all the time. Uh, for those situations, we can have um, reliability and protection for the vulnerable. Thank you. Lauren Takaris, would you please ask the next question of Mary Mashinsky? What steps would you take to prevent a significant number of individuals and families becoming homeless after the eviction moratorium eventually ends? I'm working on some of those right now. Uh, again, they need an income. Ideally, Congress will get their act together and they will pass the extended uh, stimulus funds. That's what we really need. That'll get us to the vaccine. But uh, there are some people that will be evicted. Um, the state may have to step in and help again with the um, rental assistance. I've, had, I've run into one problem with the constituents, which is they're eligible to apply for rental assistance and they haven't applied, which puts the pressure on the landlord because they can't pay their bills. And uh, I would like to bypass the landlord, have to, uh, excuse me, bypass the tenant and have the rental assistance check go directly to the landlord which will keep them afloat and it'll keep the tenant in their housing. But right now I've got people that are recalcitrant, they won't put in for the application, even though the money is there that they could apply for. Mr. Elberg. So I think this is such a good example of government just failing our residents in Connecticut. The Department of Public Housing has been given about $60 million from the governor and um, you know, only 40 families, it's been in the news, only 40 families have been served rental assistance. So if, if we're gonna create this moratorium as a state, then we have, we have to pro provide a solution as well. So I, I don't know what is going on with the Department of Housing, but they're, they're failing constituents, they're failing people who really need the help right now, and we, sh we should really look into why only a limited number, only dozens of, of families have gotten this rental assistance. And it, it's breaking the whole system. Uh, so that, that date cannot be extended any further, in my opinion, because the system is already being broken for the last six months. And you know, we have to look at, at the state agencies that are Thank supposed you. to take care of this. Thank you. 
Mike Gagney, would you please ask the last question of Weston Ulbrich? Tens of thousands of state residents will be voting by absentee ballot this year. Should the state move to implement mail-in voting statewide and retire the in-person polling place? What do you think? I didn't catch that last part. My oh, so should the state move to implement mail-in voting statewide and retire the in-person po polling place? No, I, I don't think it. I think it should be an option for people when there's an emergency like COVID, uh, coronavirus. Um, I think it was a mistake to blindly send ballots or requests for ballots out to every person in the books in our state. It's never happened before. Uh, you know, I'm all for one vote, one person. It's just that, you know, uh, you know they, they just didn't, they didn't have the database that can keep up with people moving in and out of our state. So they should have left it up to people to request absentee ballots. It would be more fair. Now, now people might not, not, might not sign their, their ballot. And if they don't sign it, it's not going to count. And that's not, I'm not sure that's all their fault because they're not used to this. So we have to keep in-person in, uh, in -person voting. It's part of the American way. Ms. Mischinski. Uh, COVID makes it necessary to offer absentee ballot uh, to more people this year. And more people are taking advantage of it, which is very good. Um, I would give them the choice of either or, and then phase, I would like to phase in, make it easier to vote for people. Out in some of the western states like Colorado, everybody votes by absentee now. It's, it's no big deal. They just, they have busy lives and they're trying to get to work and take care of their kids and pick up their kids and they just vote a few days ahead of time with their ballot and uh, there haven't been any problems there. So. It's something we are starting to get used to in Connecticut, and we're not used to it yet, but it's no, it's no biggie in other states. There isn't really a reason why we can't do it. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Each candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement. Ms. Mashinsky, will you please begin? Thank you, and I do want to thank the Wallingford Community Women for setting this up again and our reporters for coming and asking the questions. Um, people have to judge whether or not I've done my uh, job as an incumbent. And uh, this year, it was especially important to deal with the pandemic. There were, right after we started session, when I expe expected to pass more bills, we stopped the session, had to go back to our districts and work on people who are suffering from the pandemic. There were half a million people out of work, 3,500 out of work just in Wallingford. And they were calling me because they needed help with unemployment or in some cases food, in some cases medical supplies, in some cases uh, hospitalization. And I worked for those people for months and all summer and spring and summer and into the fall. And that is my job as a state representative. And I'm, it's my duty and I'm happy to do it. Now I have to think about post-pandemic. When we come out of this, I have to get people rehired and back into another career. And that's why apprenticeships are so important and why I've worked on them for 10 years. I'm also pushing lifelong learning for people to upgrade their skills on a regular basis because that's the way the new economy is going to be. My service to the district has included projects that the district needs, defending the town's education money, their sewage treatment money, and starting up and building the Quinnipiac River Linear Trail, which is my favorite local project. My vision for the future is that we work more on energy efficiency and on alternative energy, both for climate change reasons and also because it'll save people money. It is a high cost state, as my opponent has noted. The main cost problem for us is uh, energy. So we get a two for here. We get people to be employed and we save money. Elon Musk, uh, 10 years ago, used stimulus funds for energy to start his electric car business. He invented the car and then he put it to market. He was a clever guy to use the stimulus funds. And we can use our energy investment in Connecticut to get people to do that kind of work in Connecticut, to invent something efficient, 
that makes it easier to live here and more cheaply. And that is what I would like to do as a state representative in the next term. I ask for your support on November 3rd. Thank you. Mr. Ulbrich. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Wes Ulbrich. I'm running for state rep here in the 85th district against someone who's been here for 39 years in the same seat. I just think it's time that we make a change for our state so we can reverse the economic trends, the, the negative economic trends that have plagued us long term now uh, for decades. So this is why I'm running. I'm, I'm uh, running up for the people. Our campaign is about people. It's not really about me. It's not about a family business. It's, it's about serving others in a more complete way and serving more people than what we do now. It's about Wallingford and the future of Connecticut, which I care deeply about. I'm, I'm getting married and I, in April, and I, I intend to stay in Connecticut my whole life. I love this state. I, I love Wallingford, where my family's been for 112 years. Uh, so I'm not going anywhere. So I'm going to fight tirelessly for the people, for affordability, so people can stay here, raise a family, and rebuild our economy back from overregulation and higher taxes compared to the rest of the nation. So we have to seek hybrid models of government that use the private sector, empower nonprofits to do state services. Um, it's time for changes that promote what Wallingford does so well, which is fiscal responsibility. Our town's known for that. Uh, you know, we, we have to innovate, and Connecticut has a history of innovation, and we have to attract more advanced manufacturers and those who are sustainable. 92% of, of exports are from manufacturing in our state. Seven-tenths of each dollar created by manufacturing goes back into the economy. That's above any other sector in our economy in Connecticut. So we can't be losing these advanced manufacturers any longer. We can't be losing 800 jobs like we did with Bristol-Myers. We have to reverse that. So we need a friend of business in this seat. We need a legislator, not a regulator. I believe that a lot of actions by my opponent have been regulatory when she teams up with DEP and blocks, blocks jobs here, right here in Wallingford. Um, so no, I also want to bring a hopeful message, though, because not, not all is lost. We have a great thing going here. We just have to reverse some economic trends and be more competitive compared to our neighbors. Um, so if you, if you believe in my campaign, then please cast a ballot, cast your ballot for me, Wes Ulbrich. And I really want to thank the Wallingford community women. I want to thank Representative Mushinsky for her many decades of service to our town, to our state. It's very commendable. I've had such an education running for office, and you know I really respect uh, her efforts for so long. So thank you, and thank you, voters, for working on, you know, for for voting pretty much, and in, in upholding our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the 85th Assembly District segment of the 2020 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford Community Women. I thank you for watching and remind you to please vote on November 3rd.